I'm curious about some of your preferences around a few ideas. How do you feel about going fast? Are you into crowd control? What about not taking any damage? And how do you feel about doing damage? Well, do I have your attention? Here are the timestamps for each chapter. You will also find them in the timeline and in the description. This guide is lengthy and exists to be highly technical. And because of this, I'm certain I've made a lot of mistakes, at least in terms of consolidating the information and delivering it to you in the most efficient way. So these timestamps should help you get the most out of the video. This is the first time I've written and read a script of this size, or took on an editing job this intricate. So please feel free to give me feedback on things I did well, things I did poorly, and how I can improve if I choose to do another video like this in the future. Thank you for watching, and I hope this video proves itself to be useful. Okay, so Zephyr's like, great and all, but um, she must be like, really hard to get. Okay, hold on. Yes, Zephyr has some very powerful and effective abilities. However, I need to stress that the damage you saw me do in the intro is not entirely a product of Zephyr herself. Zephyr is not as much of a powerhouse as she is a weapons platform. She amplifies the power of your weapons, but the damage itself is not coming from Zephyr's abilities, at least mostly. This works out well for her though, because it only means that Zephyr isn't going to reach a point or a level where her abilities start to fall off or become ineffective. Instead, she's going to continue to scale up in power as you get better mods and equipment. Because of this, there's not a reason you shouldn't be getting Zephyr as soon as you can. Especially because she's really easy to get. All you need to do to get her is go to the clan dojo and replicate her parts. And once that's done, it's not hard to get her after that because her parts need a lot of very common materials, all of which can be found in the first part of the star chart. You'll find 90% of the components needed for her on the planets between Mercury and Mars, You'll only need a few more after that from Deimos, Phobos, and Europa, but you won't need to go any further than that to find all the resources needed. The worst thing you'll need though is 600 Oxium, and that's going to be split between your three components. If you've been playing for a while, you likely already have that much Oxium, but if you're newer and don't have that, I suggest you run a bunch of endless corpus missions. As far as the wiki's concerned though, these missions are probably the best. While you're doing those missions, keep an eye out for these guys. These enemies are Oxium Osprey, and they drop what you need, they drop Oxium. However, you need to kill them real quick, because if you don't, they're gonna rush you and explode. If they explode, you get no Oxium. If you do kill them, they're gonna drop around 7 to 12 Oxium each, which is a bit slow. So it's recommended that you go and get the help of a Necros and maybe a Nova to speed up the mission, and that should help push things along a little quicker. Moving on to base stats for Zephyr. Zephyr has base 150 health and shields, and these scale up to 450 at rank 30, unremarkable armor of 100, 100 energy capacity at base, scaling up to 150 at level 30, and a base sprinting speed of 1.15. Zephyr Prime only differs very slightly. She gets 125 armor and has 150 energy at base, scaling up to 225 at level 30, and a base sprint speed of 1.2. Other than that, she's identical. Overall, Zephyr has less than average base stats. She does have an above average sprint speed, making her a little bit faster than other frames, but overall, not much to report here. 
You would wonder with stats like these. So Zephyr is pretty bad, right? Well, no, because Zephyr's abilities are going to cover for her in the areas where she's lacking. Primarily, that's defense. Before we get into the actual abilities, though, we do have a passive ability to cover, so let's get into that. Zephyr kind of has two passives. The first is Zephyr has reduced gravity and increased control and mobility while airborne. This may take some getting used to if you aren't as comfortable with Warframe's parkour system, but adjustment shouldn't take too long. If her reduced gravity is too bothersome, you can obtain the augment of Anchored Glide, which will remove Zephyr's altered gravity and provide a small 15% power strength buff, but we're going to talk about the augments later on in the video. The second part of Zephyr's passive is that she gains an additive 150% critical chance buff to all weapons when she's airborne. If you don't care about the technicalities or the numbers, you can just think of this as adding another 150% crit chance mod to your weapon. This is enough to push some weapons into orange crit territory depending on the crit mods you use. If all you have is a max rank point strike, you're gonna need a weapon with a crit chance of at least 26% to get orange crits with Zephyr's passive. If you have access to critical delay, you'll need a weapon with at least a critical chance of 23%. Now I'm actually going to demonstrate, so there are going to be some numbers, but here's an in-depth demo on what exactly this 150% critical chance is doing. For the demo, I'm using a Kuva Karak. At base, it has a crit chance of 23% and a critical multiplier of 2.1. I have it modded with critical delay, which adds 200% critical chance. This gives us a modded critical chance of 69% which means we have a 69% chance to do 2.1 times damage on hit. Zephyr's critical passive is applied to the base crit value of 23%, just like the 200% from the critical delay. The resulting value from this is going to be 103.5%. Now we have a guaranteed 100% chance to get yellow crits, and always do 2.1 times damage, and a 3-4% to chance to get an orange crit and deal 4.2 times damage. Don't worry, that's the only math I'm going to make you sit through. We can start moving into the main abilities now, but before we do, let me state that all the stats and numbers I mention about each ability are the base stats of a fully ranked Zephyr Warframe. These are the numbers that the Warframe mods will scale off of when we're modding. Okay, now we can go on. The first ability is Tailwind. Tailwind is split into three different abilities, one for dashing across long distances, one that can do some damage, and one that allows Zephyr to hover in the air but for the sake of organization, we're going to keep this chapter focused on the dash. Tailwind propels Zephyr in a direction of the aiming reticle at a speed of 30 meters per second for one second. While in flight, Zephyr generates an air current in front of her. The air current has a radius of 2 meters and inflicts 750 slash damage, as well as knocks down all enemies who come into contact with the air current. Tailwind costs 25 energy to cast from the ground, however, the cost is halved to 12.5 when cast when Zephyr isn't touching the ground. This only means that when you want to use Tailwind, it's better to jump off the ground to use it first, so you don't spend energy you don't need to spend. As far as mod scaling goes with Tailwind, contact damage is affected by ability strength, the contact radius is affected by ability range, the flight speed and overall distance traveled is affected by ability duration, strangely enough, and the energy cost and energy discount are affected by ability efficiency. The distance, though, of Tailwind does not scale off of range, like I said before. The specification that is altered is actually meters per second, as opposed to meters traveled, or meters of acceleration, or whatever makes more sense to you. The duration of the dash itself is also not increased by mods. Generally, in normal missions, I don't find myself using Tailwind to get around. When Zephyr's modded, especially in the way that I suggest you're gonna mod her, it's pretty much guaranteed that you're gonna sling Zephyr face first into a wall or a corner, and you're gonna be stuck there for a bit. Because of that, it's not a great way to get around in closed tile sets. There are more options in more open locations. This could be in certain tile sets or any of the open worlds, you know, Plains, or Valis, Deimos. But it still isn't justifiable when you have the Arcwing Launcher segment, since that doesn't require energy at all. So for the most part, use it when you feel like it, but you're not going to have many great reasons to use it. As far as obscure details go, the aim glide duration is reset every time you use Tailwind. This hugely increases the distances you can get across when using Tailwind, since so much momentum is conserved for the duration of the aim glide. It's also worth noting that Zephyr is vulnerable to crowd control, such as staggers and knockdowns, while using Tailwind. 
And while the practicality of this use case in particular is questionable, you can use Tailwind to pass through laser barriers without harm or knockback in most cases. All right, now we have Dive Bomb. Aim downward and cast Tailwind while you're in the air to perform Dive Bomb. Upon doing so, Zephyr dives straight down, continuing to accelerate until she hits the ground. Upon contact, Zephyr creates an explosion with a 7 meter radius from the point of impact. It costs 12.5 energy to cast. The mod scaling for Dive Bomb is pretty simple. Base damage is affected by ability strength, the explosion radius is affected by ability range, and the cost is affected by efficiency. But the initial speed is not affected by mods. The total explosion damage of Dive Bomb does depend on the height at which you cast it. The equation for this is simple and you don't need to remember it, but just so you know how it works, the total damage is calculated by multiplying the base damage of the ability, so that's even after mods, with power strength for example. You multiply that number by 0.2 times the activation height, which you're not going to keep track of, but for example, casting Dive Bomb at 15 meters will yield 0.2 times 15 times 450 at base, which equals 1300-500 impact damage. Activating Dive Bomb at any less than 4 meters will only inflict base damage. And damage bypasses obstacles in the environment. So depending on your range, boxes or crates that are in the way don't matter. If they're in the range, they will take the damage. Is this critical to know at all? No, not at all. But now you know. Now we're moving on to arguably the most important aspect of Tailwind, at least for Zephyr's overall kit, Hover Glide. You hold cast Tailwind to cause Zephyr to hover in the air. While you're hovering, Zephyr locks herself at the elevation the hover was cast at. While Zephyr's in Hover Glide, she's able to cast all of her abilities and use both her primary and secondary weapons without restriction. Your movement speed while you're hovering is reduced, however, but you can still use the slide button to strafe in any direction with a little bit more speed. You can exit the hover by jumping, bullet jumping, rolling, casting Tailwind again, using a quick melee attack, a slam attack, or casting Dive Bomb. Mod scaling for Tailwind is fairly straightforward. The energy cost is affected by ability efficiency, and the drain per second is affected by ability efficiency and duration. They work in compound, so you want more duration and more efficiency, and the more you push both of those up, the better the cost is going to be over time. Hover Glide is super useful for at least two reasons. First and foremost, it lets us make extended use of Zephyr's critical chance passive. The second, though, is how it improves Zephyr's defense. I won't go into too much detail right now, but it more or less nullifies a lot of the vulnerabilities Zephyr has with her main defensive ability. But we'll go more into that when we get there. As far as the things that the game doesn't tell you about how Hover Glide works, the movement speed is affected by movement mods and speed buffs, like the one from Zephyr's third augment, which does provide a speed buff, but we'll get into that later. This part, though, is a little bit more important. Hover Glide is considered a channeled ability, and channeled abilities have a penalty. So you'll notice things like energy siphon won't work, and you won't be able to get energy from energy restoration pads while this is active. This isn't a really big problem though because you're still able to kill enemies and get things like energy orbs and make use of the arcane energize effect. So as long as you're killing enemies within a decent pace, you should be able to keep your energy up just fine. And with how I'm going to show you how to play her, I don't think it'll be too much of a problem. Finally moving on to her second ability, Airburst. Zephyr throws a slice of dense air towards the aiming reticle. Once it collides into an enemy, it passes through them dealing 500 damage. Upon collision with the surface, it explodes with an 8 meter radius, dealing damage and ragdolling all enemies caught within. Each enemy directly hit by airburst or the blast radius will increase airburst's damage by 35%. The explosion has no falloff, meaning no matter where the enemy is in the blast, they're going to receive the full damage. The damage distribution of Airburst is 18.75% impact, 12.5% puncture, and 68.75% slash, and it has a 50% status chance. Tap cast Airburst to pull enemies towards the center of the blast, and hold cast it to push enemies away. The Airburst projectile itself is a bit wide, so be sure that you don't have anything to your sides or in front of you when you cast it so it doesn't get obstructed. 
Airburst's pull force lingers for two seconds on the surface it collides with. The Airburst projectiles have an innate punch through and can bypass certain objects in the environment, like closed doors, so the explosion can deal damage to enemies through walls and other cover. It can also break storage containers, meaning it can loot through walls. Casting Airburst is a one-handed action. This means it can be used while performing many other actions without interrupting them. These are things like shooting, reloading, charging a shot, hell, even charging a bow, jumping, bullet jumping, aim gliding, you can use it whenever. It's a quick and easy to do action that shouldn't inhibit the gameplay, so you won't find yourself hindered by it at all. And similar to Tailwind, it costs half as much to cast when you're in the air, so use it when you're off the ground. Mod scaling is pretty straightforward for airburst. The contact and explosion damage are affected by ability strength, the explosion radius, or the pull and push radius, is affected by ability range, and of course the ability cost is affected by efficiency. And it will always cost 50% to cast in the air. The status chance, the travel distance, the travel speed, the damage increase per enemy hit, and pull force and duration are not affected by mods, there isn't much you can do to change those. Airburst is absolutely excellent. Being able to pin enemies to a spot in Warframe is probably one of the best forms of crowd control there is. There's no limit to the number of enemies you can affect, and all caught in this radius are not able to harm you unless they have a toxic aura. And with a pile of enemies all bunched together, you really don't have multiple targets to deal with anymore. Instead, you just have one really big target. You'll often find that using a melee weapon on these large groups of enemies is going to prove to be the best way to deal with them in this state. You'll find that when you use melee weapons on these large groups, you start getting huge gains in your combo count. And this is due to all the multi-hits you get. On top of that, when the enemies are pulled together, you're usually able to get a ground finisher on all of them, which deals a lot more damage. Eventually, you'll get your hands on some AoE weapons, and those will also benefit from having a massive clump of enemies all stacked together. Airburst provides good on-demand crowd control that's cheap, and it's very powerful in melee setups. You'll also see later that it plays very well with Zephyr's fourth ability, and I'll be sure to demonstrate what I mean by that when we get there. As far as the holdcast function goes on Airburst, you can pretty much forget about it. I struggle to think of any situation where the push effect is more useful than the pull you get with the tat cast. So don't worry about using it. You can use it if you want, but you know, don't. Now we can talk about Turbulence. Turbulence is probably the simplest ability, but arguably Zephyr's most important. Turbulence creates a spherical shield around Zephyr, and deflects all incoming bullets and projectiles, even lasers. You can notice this a lot more when the projectiles are visible. It doesn't matter if the projectile is visible, or hit scan, or anything. It'll simply be deflected. Turbulence has a base radius of 6 meters, lasts 20 seconds, and costs 75 energy. Turbulence protects Zephyr from incoming projectiles, but does not make Zephyr immune to all forms of damage or crowd control. Zephyr is still vulnerable to status effects such as slash, heat, toxin, magnetic, etc. She can still be staggered and knocked down from the fire blast or toxin auras from Exodus units or shockwave moas, all non-projectile melee attacks, and all AoE attacks such as explosions, again, shockwave moas, the rockets from bombards, or fire from napalm units. The general rule of thumb is that any kind of area damage or non-projectile status effect, Zephyr's gonna wanna be wary of. All these things do exist in-game and can become more troubling to avoid as the levels scale up, but Zephyr does have a workaround, and that's with Hoverglide. While Zephyr is effectively immune to all projectiles, she's still not immune to all these other factors, and with these limitations it may cause you to think, With all these ways to get through defense, it seems like its efficacy would start to decrease as you scale into higher levels. However, you have to realize that pretty much all of these threats only exist on the ground. Melee attackers need you to be on the ground to hit you, and AoE attacks like rockets and napalm, while not able to hit you directly, can still hit the ground or while next to you and catch you in the radius of the explosion. When hovering, Zephyr is literally and figuratively above all that stuff. Rockets have no place to land next to you, melee attackers are helpless to reach you, and now you're pretty much untouchable. The only thing you need to keep an eye out for are the Eximus units and their attacks. Specifically, these are the Fire Blast Eximus, the Life and Energy Leech Eximus, and Toxic units. As you see a Fire Blast coming towards you, you just need to roll out of the way. That will put you back on the ground, but all you need to do is just jump up and keep on hovering and you'll be fine. The Energy and Life Leech units, though, will target you specifically in the air, so you just gotta strafe to one side or the other and you'll be okay. As far as Toxin units go, you just need to be sure that you can see them from afar and take them out before they can get to you. These can be Eximus units or Choice Infested units, but overall, the higher the level, the more deadly the Toxin proc is, and they can, they will, one-shot you at high enough levels. So that's the biggest threat you need to keep an eye out for. 
If you keep in line with all of these guidelines and recommendations, you will be effectively unkillable as long as you're recasting Turbulence anytime it goes out. Turbulence's mod scaling is rather straightforward. The shield radius is affected by ability range, the shield duration is affected by ability duration, and energy cost is affected by ability efficiency. A couple things worth noting are, modding for lots of range will actually make you an effective shield for mission objectives such as defense points or cryopods, data terminals, excavators, and even live defense targets. But lowering the ability range can actually make it more likely to get hit by area damage from diverted projectiles while moving. So like if you divert a rocket and you have low range, there's less of a radius there so it'll land closer to you and you'll get hurt. Hi, quick editing note here. I really don't recommend going under 100% range with Zephyr. The way it negatively impacts air burst is too detrimental to the kit in my opinion, so unless you know exactly what you're doing, don't go under 100%. So now the question is, what are the use cases of Turbulence? It doesn't work that way. There aren't any use cases. Turbulence should literally be on all of the time. It is without question one of Zephyr's top priorities while she's in the game. If you remember her stats, Zephyr does not have the health or armor stats to stay alive for any meaningful period of time when she's up against higher level enemies. When you need to recast Turbulence, you need to be aware that there's going to be a specific period of time where you're vulnerable. Before that happens, you need to preemptively lock enemies down with airburst or get them tied up in the tornadoes. This will give you a period of time where you're more or less safe to cast Turbulence again without having to worry about weapon fire from enemies. When Turbulence is down, Zephyr can't take more than a couple hits from enemies, especially when they're higher level. So having everything set up and open for you to cast it again is probably one of the most important things to be on the lookout for. At least when you're doing higher level stuff. One thing I neglected to put in the script was just a reminder that on lower level missions, you don't need to be as scared of keeping Turbulence up at all times, but it certainly does help and it is a priority still. You just don't need to worry about evaporating the moment it goes down. Zephyr's ultimate, Tornado. If you've been overwhelmed by any of the information up until this point, Tornado's worse. So maybe to give you an option to run away from that, the things you need to know about Tornado is that it turns everything into an AoE weapon. Everything. Even bows and snipers. Tornado's gonna pick enemies up within a 10 meter radius, not affected by mods, and it's going to keep them ragdolled and suspended in the air. To kill the enemies held in the tornado, you're going to shoot the tornado, not the enemies. And shooting the tornadoes is going to grant you two times modded critical damage, so critical weapons are suggested. Tap cast to create wandering tornadoes that'll move around and follow enemies, and hold cast to create stationary tornadoes that will not move. You can manually move the wandering tornadoes around by aiming down sights. Doing so will make the nearest tornado follow where you're aiming. Stationary tornadoes aren't going to move at all. The tornadoes are going to inherit any elemental damage you have modded on your weapon, regardless of status chance. Tornadoes deal damage at a rate of 4 times a second, and the damage they deal will be scaled off of power strength. If they have no elemental bonus, they're going to do impact, puncture, and slash. Shooting them with a weapon that has elemental damage will make them deal that damage instead. I think that just about covers it for the short version. You can move on if you want. For those of you who are staying, we're going to get a little... technical. So since you're here, I guess we can get into it. Um, Tornado is what makes Zephyr so monstrous, at least in terms of doing huge area damage to literal rooms of enemies, and also making those enemies helpless to do anything about it. I know I'm the one who's making a 50 minute long video of Zephyr, but there are still aspects of Tornado that I just don't have a full understanding of. Some of the weirder, more bizarre behaviors of Tornado are just not documented, and if they are, it's one video and the information delivery is just not that good. I'm still gonna link some of those videos later, but I'm, 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 I'm telling you all this because I want you to know that I don't know everything, but I really did look into it, so I know a good bit. Now that I've gotten that disclaimer out of the way, let me tell you what I've observed about Tornado. From what I've seen, the Tornadoes and their 10 meter pickup range are effectively giant hitboxes. These glorified hitboxes basically inherit the damage your bullet, projectile, or even a melee weapon would do, and applies that damage from that singular attack to everyone caught in the tornadoes or within their surrounding area of effect, even enemies that are immune to crowd control and ragdoll effects. Additionally, tornado will inherit any elemental damage you have equipped on a weapon, regardless of status chance. 
All that means is, if you have a weapon that has 2% status chance and it still has an elemental effect on it, it will still take the elemental damage you have modded on there because the damage is still present. The gun itself just doesn't proc a status effect as much. Status effects and elemental damage are different, by the way. Go watch a Warframe damage video, or something. This makes Tornado quite good at spreading status effects to massive amounts of enemies with very little effort. All it takes is one shot for a Tornado to inherit that damage type, and then it deals that elemental damage four times every second, and fairly consistently procs that status effect. I'm not too sure about how I missed these details in the script, given I went to the effort to screenshot all these, but these are the more obscure ways Tornado works with elements. Uh, I'm not going to read them, just because I'm scared I'm going to lose the few of you who have stuck around this long. So if you're interested, I'll just scroll them past the screen right now, and you can pause and read them. But just for the sake of time, we're just going to not go too hard into these. One obscurity that I've noticed is that it seems like the game sees the damage from your weapons and tornadoes as separate things. When you're playing and just observing how it works, it seems like the tornadoes are taking the weapon damage you do and distributing it to everyone in their grasp, but I don't think that's what's happening. At least not exactly. It seems like it's taking the damage you do, putting it through its critical multiplier filter, and then they, the tornadoes, do the damage to all the enemies in their area. Unless there's a couple weird cases where it doesn't seem to work that way, specifically with the Entrati weapons, because when using the Entrati weapons, tornado kills count as kills for the Entrati weapon secondary attack, which makes it possible to get repeated usage of the secondary attack, which is super overpowered and completely broken and maybe even a bug, but, you know, it's like, consistency and Warframe aren't a thing, so, <laughs> whatever. Okay, yada yada. Mod scaling, easy. The tick damage every second is enhanced by ability strength, the duration of Tornado is affected by ability duration, and efficiency is affected by efficiency. The distributed damage is locked at 100%, the critical damage multiplier is locked at 2 times, the Tornado height and movement speed are not affected by mods, and most interestingly, ability range does not affect the pickup range of Tornado. That's actually locked at 10 meters. What it affects is the spawn radius, or in other words, how far away you can cast them. Having a really big range will make the Wandering Tornado spawn way out there, and also let you cast the stationary ones further away. It's aging, mate. These tornadoes are going to blow arse unless I can get them above 10 meters of pickup range. You remember when I said Airburst had a very useful synergy with Tornado, right? While the pickup radius of Tornado is locked at 10 meters, we still have a way to get enemies into its influence from further away, and that's by using Airburst. If we can use Airburst to move enemies around, we can use it to get enemies into the radius of Tornado's pickup. Or, I guess, put more simply, Airburst essentially acts as Tornado's extended pickup range. Tornadoes are excellent for crowd control and offense. You'll likely find yourself using the stationary ones more than the wandering ones, especially in missions where you don't need to move around as much, like camping and survival or defense missions. For me, I think the best way to use it is to stay in one spot, use Hover Glide to boost your critical chance, Airburst to continually pull enemies into its effect, and just watch as enemies disintegrate under the critical multiplier bonus and the status effects. But they aren't just limited to offensive roles. They're also capable of protecting areas of interest. A fair example of this is using the Wandering Tornadoes during interception missions, as they can kind of move on their own and figure out where all the enemies are themselves, giving you a way to mindlessly crowd control everything. Hi, post message again. I wanted to bring this in real quick, because, um, again, it's missing in the script. But don't neglect your single-target heavy hitter weapons. Especially if you're watching this and you're later on in the game, and AoE's kind of a big deal. Tornado gives every weapon the ability to do huge AoE damage. And honestly, I found that single-target heavy hitting weapons are honestly just more effective on Tornado. I think it has something to do with how tornadoes register what hits them, like the projectile of AoE weapons themselves usually don't do as much damage like on the Exceltra, and instead want to take the hit from the explosion itself, but I'm not really sure how it works. Overall, just wanted to let you know that the single target weapons in Warframe are still excellent and Zephyr makes great use of them. Please don't neglect them. Thank you, moving on. The way I wrote the abilities in this script was the summary, the mod scaling, the use cases, and the obscurities, but since Tornado is so obscure on its own anyway, these next details can honestly be put into their own categories. So, this is obscurity number one, and it's about how Tornado makes really interesting use with some lesser used status types. 
specifically with gas and electricity. If you've been playing Warframe for any amount of time, you probably know that Viral, Heat, and Corrosive have dominated the popularity charts, specifically against the Grenier and maybe Toxin for Corpus. Of course, these are generalizations, but there's two damage types in particular that's gone lesser used, and that's gas, also electric. We don't use it very much because gas damage struggles very heavily against armor. That is not to say it's not powerful, but to make gas damage work, you really gotta work with it, and it really can do some work. According to the wiki, this is how the gas damage works. I'll also leave a link in the description for a good explanation on how gas damage works from a guy who really knows what he's talking about. All Zephyr needs, though, is just a crit weapon that hits really hard with a good critical multiplier, with gas on that weapon, and even better, some hunter munitions for slash, and that'll get the job done. Even with the limitations that gas damage has, things change when you include Tornado to the equation. And this is where it's going to start getting theoretical, because I can tell you the result of gas damage and Tornado is absolutely monstrous, but I cannot tell you exactly where that damage is coming from. But I have noticed variables that greatly influence how much damage this combination does, so I think I know what it is. Let's just talk about it. First step to this, you need a weapon that deals a lot of damage. A crit weapon, like a sniper or a bow. Assault rifles, even. I suppose the beginning damage of the shot doesn't super matter. It does matter. You want it to be good. I guess you could think of it as the snowball effect. The bigger the snowball you start with, maybe the bigger the ball's gonna get, but it's going to grow exponentially anyway, so maybe it doesn't matter so much. I need to make a stipulation. This damage strategy only really works for steel path levels and around that area. You need to be doing some amount of heavy damage to make this work. You can't just take a little Bratton with gas damage on it and expect results. It doesn't work that way. Step two, you want a lot of enemies. And by a lot of enemies, I mean you either need four people in a survival mission, and maybe even that, it's not going to be quite enough. But really, when I say a lot of enemies, I mean steel path level enemies. So using this in lower level missions might be kind of pointless. Like I previously mentioned. Now that you have the weapon to do it, and the enemies to use it on, go ahead and shoot the tornado like normal. And notice how they die very quickly. Like, really quickly. What I think is happening here is that you shoot the tornado and it inherits the gas status brock. And also that damage is being dealt to the enemies and they all get a gas cloud on their head. Those gas clouds are not only stacking on top of each other and doing like a layered kind of damage sort of deal, but the gas clouds are also continuing to proc that damage on the tornadoes themselves. And it kind of turns into this really nasty feedback loop where the amount of enemies you have with those gas procs is going to hugely influence the amount of damage done to everyone. This means having less enemies in tornado will severely impact how well gas damage works in this application. I think the source of the damage we're getting here is coming from the way gas's status effect works with Tornado. When an enemy is inflicted with gas, they're covered in a gas cloud around their head. And I think that gas cloud can directly interface with Tornado, dealing gas damage to it, and then allowing the cycle to continue. I'm pretty sure we can call this quadratic scaling, which means the damage you do is x squared, x meaning the number of enemies. So quite literally exponential, I think. Overall, the tornado seems to make gas create some evil cycle of exponential damage increase, or at least it's something like that. Gas on its own really does struggle against Grenier and their armor. If we introduce tornado, the damage numbers start going off so quick that you don't even get a shot to read them because the game can only display so many damage numbers at once. And despite the fact that gas is limited to 8 to 10 procs per enemy, it still eats everyone alive. Electricity works in pretty much the same way, so using electricity in conjunction with gas is a pretty good idea. One weapon I recommend for the synergy is the Basmu, as you're able to get gas and electricity without having to slot for electricity. Next on the list of obscurities is Tornado's Inherent Crit Mechanic. Be aware that this one qualifies as maybe a bit more on the advanced side. This one I don't know very much about. This one I have not gone into looking up, I have not researched it myself. All I've seen from it is one video by a person who didn't explain it as well as I wish he would have. In essence, this whole mechanic kind of functions as a way to take the primary weapons that have a dual fire mode and migrate the critical stats from the primary fire mode to the secondary one, as the secondary ones generally don't have great critical chances. But other than that, I'll leave it up to Dystopia to explain to you. The video title is right here, and the link is in the description. There are a couple bugs Tornado has and I'm going to tell you the most important ones right now. 
for those of you who are later in the game, the damage tornadoes do, do not benefit from mods that give you a condition overload kind of status. Or rather, mods that add slash multiply damage done to enemies based on the number of status effects they have. My guess as to why this happens is because the game sees a difference between the damage your weapons do themselves and the damage your weapons cause Tornado to do. As much of a bummer as it is, I don't think Tornado really needs any extra help doing damage, so whatever. But still be nice if they fixed it. This one's a little bit more important. It may take you a while to experience this, but the Tornadoes actually seem to have something of a damage cap, or in other words, after 500,000 points of damage have been dealt to the Tornadoes themselves, they just stop applying damage from your weapons to the enemy. And that does sound scary, because we do so much damage, right? All the mods, you see all these crazy numbers. Well, there is a stipulation. The tornadoes don't take the same damage an enemy does. Tornadoes seem to take object damage, or a certain version of it. This is the same damage you do to an explosive barrel or a storage crate. Meaning it does not take crit stats into account, or status. It's just the raw damage you see on the paper, or on the mod screen of the weapon, or at least it's close. Your weapons just don't do a ton of damage under those circumstances. And the best way that I've found to reach this damage cap is to use gas. It's not the only way to reach the damage cap, but it is one of the fastest. If you do reach this cap and you find that the tornadoes aren't delivering the damage from your guns anymore, just recast it and it'll be back to normal. When I was running missions, getting footage for this video, I was using gas damage on Steel Path, and I noticed that I was recasting a lot more often than I would have liked to. How fast you reach the damage cap does come down to what weapon it is, and how you use it, and how often you shoot it, and how much gas is being dealt, but overall, at least with the weapon I was using, the Trumna, I found myself considering, maybe I am doing too much damage. Recasting Tornado isn't much of a problem for me at least, because I was getting good enough energy, but with it happening fairly consistently on every set of tornadoes that I casted, it would stop working after like 30 seconds or maybe even 20. So I wanted to make it known to you that it is possible to maybe do too much damage, and that if you're not running with a lot of efficiency, it might just be worth bringing corrosive or viral instead, or just bringing a secondary weapon, or better yet, an arc gun with gas on it, so you can still get that effect when you want it, but just not all the time when you don't need it. And let's see, is there anything else to... Check my script real quick. No! It doesn't look like it. You made it through the tornado explanation. Good job. Hopefully it wasn't too mind-boggling and you understood everything. Uh, I don't know how I made it. My voice is hoarse and it hurts, but uh... Let's just do a quick... Too long didn't watch tornado recap. Cast tornado, shoot the tornadoes. Hold down the cast button to keep them in place. Tap it to make them wander around. Use air burst to get people in their grasp. If you're doing steel path, don't overlook things like gas and electricity. They can be rather monstrous. Tornadoes also multiply modded critical damage by two, so critical weapons are recommended. Use hover glide to get more crit, so more crit, more damage. And I think that's about it. That's all you really need to know. Boo! Hey, uh, threw you for a loop there. Um, we're doing the builds. Um, for Zephyr. What do you even put on Zephyr? Um, I'm also going, I'm not going on a script, by the way. I, I never scripted this part. Uh, so, we're doing impromptu. Um, okay, so, this one goes here, that one goes there. Okay, so, it's a super budget. If you just get Zephyr, you're in the game. Oh, great, now you have Zephyr, excellent. You may not even have an aura mod to slot into her. And also, this one, this, 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 Zephyr, uh, ah! The Zephyr does have a reactor. But, for this build, it, it's marked directly at 30. You're going to get a little bit of extra range. You'll have a little bit of duration. Streamline is there uh, at rank 3 and Vitality at rank 4. This will clip right at rank 30. Or right at uh, 30 capacity. Now if you have an aura to match Rejuvenation for example, we can fit a good bit more on there. We have Augur Message um, for even more duration. Uh, streamline is actually maxed out. There's uh, room for uh, rank 1 flow which is honestly a a fair increase. Uh, adds 50 more points of energy. I thought that'd be less, truthfully. And a rank 4 vitality. Uh, that stays the same. Now, if you manage to get a reactor, um, the build stays the same, more or less, and you can even fit one more thing in here, assuming you have the matching aura. Vitality is maxed, flow is maxed. Um, everything else is the same. Um, this is only here, assuming that maybe there's not much else to put there. You can put shields, maybe. This is a flex slot, do what you like. Now, this is a reactor, um, no prime mods, but as you can see, we've finally broken into Deimos, 
and you've gotten yourself a couple of corrupted mods. Uh, we 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 like overextend it on Zephyr because Zephyr does not care about strength in 99% of cases. And never minded for ability rank or ability duration. Uh, the only half rank though. Um, you like I mentioned earlier in the video, I really don't recommend going below a certain point with range because range is quite important to Zephyr and Airburst. Um, but essentially, you know, I mean, you can, you, you are welcome to make changes to this, by the way. I mean, I'm not going to enforce anything on you. Now, mid-invest. We have prime continuity. This is ranked up way too high for where I think this build is in the game. Uh, these were for testing. Aerodynamic. Um, you shouldn't be taking much damage in the air anyway, thanks to turbulence, but this is there. Um, the aim glide is also helpful. Um... These are just the general suggestions, though. Um, we'll move over to the uh, the Zephyr Prime, the one I usually use, and I'll walk you through the builds that I have there. Uh, some of the builds I actually have for Augments, so we might touch on the Augments a little bit, but not to the degree that I've done in the rest of the video. So the Augments will be a little bit covered, but just not um, as much as we'd like for now. Okay, Zephyr Prime. We have the build that I generally run. Um, at this point, I have Arcanes. I mean, I've been playing for nine freaking years, um, so I better. Molt Reconstruct. Zephyr does not have a great way to regenerate health. This is the most efficient way I've found to do it, as Zephyr's casting abilities fairly frequently. Um, six health for each energy point spent. It's fine. There are other ways to do it, and I'm sure someone who knows better is like, oh, dude, this is a waste of a slot. I don't really care. This is what I use. Um, efficiency for more duration. Um, beforehand, actually, I recently made the, this was, I think, Augur Reach? Yeah, this, I, I, I originally had Augur Reach here. There we go. Yeah, so I had a lot more range, up to 18 meters on, uh, Airburst. But the lack of duration was actually kind of getting to me after so long. So, um, you can make that stipulation, whether you want more range or more duration. It's up to you. Those are the most important things for Zephyr anyway. Um, it's good to have fleeting expertise or efficiency in general. Um, that does take a hit to the duration, though, so be mindful of that. Now, we're going to ignore this one. This one has Entangle. Uh, ooh, slow. There, don't even worry about this. This is experimental. I'll show you anyway. Okay, this is a dive bomb build. This is what I'm going to be covering in the next video, in the next part. That'll be much shorter, I promise. Um, this one, we do want a little bit of strength because dive bomb will, like, uh, target, sorry, target fixation. Um, each enemy hit will increase the damage uh, target fixation does. Or rather, tailwind does. And there's no cap. It does not, there's no, there's no capacity, there's no maximum limit. It goes as high as you want it to go. The only stipulation is the damage bonus resets when you're on the ground for two seconds. Now we want this, we want this 100% uh, damage increase per enemy to scale off of a slightly bigger number than just, you know, maybe 450,000, but... You're going to be hitting a lot of enemies, and this is a meme build anyway, so it's up to you how you want to use it, but target fixation is how I got those crazy numbers in the uh, combat intro with, um, you know, all those giant numbers from doing a dive bomb. This is the mod that does it, and it's quite fun, but you really do need to play around it, and there, I guess there technically is no limit except to the limitations that you need to put on yourself for staying off the ground. Now big pistol. This is for airburst rounds. Airburst rounds is, uh, fun. It's fun. Uh, there's, this is too much strength though, and I'll tell you why. So at base, each enemy hit by airburst will increase the secondary damage for 40%. That 40% is the same as a, uh, just like a hornet strike mod. It, it works the same way. It's additive damage. So, Later on in the game, it starts to maybe feel like there's not as much going on, but there is a little something going on there. It maxes out at 500. Uh, 500%. Uh, there's nothing you can do to break that limit. Um, and with this much strength, the damage increase goes from 40% per enemy to 91. With the uh, the situations that I'm going to be using this in, or generally, like, it's still path, it's really not hard to max out that 500%. So, it might, it's probably more worth going back into duration or range or efficiency at the cost of strength, because you do not need this much. And honestly, Eclipse, as great as it is, I don't know how useful it is when you have Tornado anyway. 
Um, the Inherent Crypt build, I went over this slightly, but hopefully you'll watch um, Dystopia's video on it instead. Because I remember this very little, but Inherit Crit... No, this is their Slam attack build, which I was going to go over with uh, um, the other augment, Funnel Clouds. Zato's Whisper is cool. Don't, over, don't, don't overlook it. Um, you can just take a look at this and go watch one of their videos instead, uh, for now. But I will come back to this later, like I said before. And the general use build. Um, you know, general use. A little bit of everything everywhere. Um, let me, I forgot to mention, uh, arcanes. Big pistol, arcane velocity on a critical hit. Fire rate to pistols. This is as fun as it gets. Very fun. Um, multi efficiency and multi augmented, uh, for strength on the dive bomb build. So, I mean, the strength goes up. This is a 60% critical mod. Sorry, strength mod at maxed. So, we're at 190 strength when we kill 250 enemies. That does bode well for the build. Um, but generally, this is the one that I stick with. I like this one the most. Uh, Brief Respite is optional. I mean, uh, usually people use Brief Respite for shield gating. Uh, I don't know how worth it that is for shield gating. I didn't talk about Rolling Guard. Rolling Guard. I, sorry this is so all over the place. I really want to get this out. Um, Rolling Guard is very nice when Turbulence runs out. Because there will be times when you forget. That's just going to happen. You cannot recast it while it's active. There's going to be a moment where you're vulnerable, and you notice you're taking damage, you do rolling guard, you're safe for three seconds, enough to cast Turbulence again and get up off the ground. So that's quite important for me, at least. Um, I certainly still die because I'm paying less attention these days. Um, but, you know, there are times when you, when you hunker down and pay attention and things go well and you could stay there forever. But there are the builds I recommend for Zephyr. I will leave the video here and invite you to check back later on in the month, maybe even next month, for the augments. And depending on how this video is received, we'll, uh, that will govern if there's another one. <laughs> hey, so that's it for now. I, I feel kind of scummy leaving it there, but I've honestly been so excited to get this out. And I don't have anything ready for the augment mods or any, or any of the audio or assets at the moment. And I people have been waiting on this for a while, so... We're going to leave it at 47 minutes. Dear Lord. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for watching. If any of you have, this is the first time I've done anything like this. And maybe I shouldn't feel as bad leaving it a, a two-parter if it's a two... Uh, I mean, if it's a first-time thing. So, I won't, I won't beat myself up over it too bad. Please, please be sure to look at the description and uh, check out all my friends who decided to cameo here. That means thank you, Grayson Allen. Thank you, Smo. Thank you, Echo and Zrolax. You guys are the best. I greatly appreciate you. Please go follow their channels in the description. And thank you for Dystopia and Gamble, who I mentioned earlier in the video, about the gas damage and the Zephyr builds, because they understand the game at a level that I wish I could, but just haven't really gotten there yet. Maybe someday. Um, they're excellent, they're comprehensive, and just generally highly informative. Thank you again, all of you. I'll just many thank yous to uh, to everyone who's watched. Um, not only to my friends who wanted to watch this, but if you've stumbled across it and found it informative, please tell me. I'm going to omit any criticism of this is too long because let me tell you, I know, <laughs> I know it's too I know it's too long. I should maybe take a writing class. Um, but overall, that was Zephyr. Zephyr is excellent. Uh, I'll be sure to link part two in the video somewhere when it's out in the description as well. So, if you're watching this later, it might already be out. So, there you go. Thanks again, and I'll see you later. Upon collision with a surface, the slice explodes with an 8 meter radius, which deals damage as well as knockdown and 